introduce Max Ikin, who's going to speak about um, his work, his unique work with MR lymphangiogram and, and his um, technology in helping these patients. Uh, thanks a lot, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been doing, uh, I'm interventional audiologist like uh, Matt Hawkins, and uh, um, I'm doing uh, lymphatic intervention for 17 years. But only six, seven years ago, I actually hooked up to the lymphatic community, to the uh, uh, lymphangiomatosis uh, um, group of patients, lymphatic malformation. Uh, and since then, um, they become one of the focus of my uh, work. And it's the most uh, difficult patient for us to treat, but uh, most gratifying. So I'll just repeat uh, something that uh, uh, Mika already said. A lymphatic system is very complex. Uh, it's actually multiple lymphatic systems uh, from coming from different organs. And two ma major organs are liver and intestine. And eventually all of this lymph goes into cisterna cali and drains into subclavian vein. So this is different lymphatic system. Uh, and this is that we know about, and we, we image them, this lymphatic system every day. But there's other lymphatic system we don't know that much, but I'm sure they com uh, contribute significant amount to the uh, flow of lymph or to the some, some of the disease processes. Um, so why lymphatic system, especially the central lymphatic system, was uh, under radar of the medical community? Because it's very, very hard to image. Why? Because lymphatic system is small, ubiquitous, everywhere. It's not one continuous system like a venous or arterial or GI tract. It's actually multiple networks communicate on different levels with each other. Uh, it's very difficult to introduce dye to image that. And the only two techn techniques what we used to have is uh, lymphocentigraphy and pedolymphangiograph. Both of them are uh, truly un uh, uh, unfit to image the central lymphatic system. Yes, for lower extremity, it's pretty good, but what's going on here, it's not clear. This pedolymphangiogram technique has always been very uh, challenging and uh, tedious to do. And eventually, let's say seven, eight years ago, there's only two people in the whole country used to do those. Uh, somebody in Stanford and in my place. And the only reason we did it, not because we've been best, we, we, we're the only one that agreed to do the, these procedures. So um, recently we developed a few uh, new techniques called internal lymphangiogram, dynamic contrast enhanced MR lymphangiography, liver lymphangiography, and liver MR lymphangiography. So I will talk today about primary about, uh, MR lymphangiography. Uh, it's a very simple technique, uh, technically. Uh, we usually take a ultrasound probe, put it on the groin. We can see a big lymph node, uh, put a tiny, tiny lymph uh, needle. In adult, we actually do it even without local anesthesia. The needle is so small. And then inject dye. And this is a lymph node. Uh, and this is a needle going inside the lymph node. We try to position it uh, perfectly in the, in the center. Uh, and this is a... Uh, this is how it looks on patient. This is a tiny, tiny needle. Um, and then we got this beautiful picture of the lymphatic vessels within minutes. So what did it do? It actually provided opportunity to any intent interventionist who knows the, how to hold ultrasound, prod, put needle in the body, start doing this procedure. And that's why people in the world started to do, to, to, to do more and more, and there's a, a new interest in the lymphatic interventions and in lymphatic imaging. So, so here we inject, this is internal lymphangiogram, here we inject a, a viscous uh, contrast material lymphatic, it's called lapidal. It's actually poppy seed oil with some iodine added to that. But if we inject MR contrast agent, can we do that? Absolutely. And fortunately for us, recently, most of the MR machines started to come with detachable table because you need to put ultrasound use ultrasound probe to put an uh, uh, ultrasound machine to put a needle, you cannot bring ultrasound machine in the MR suit because it's a huge magnet that sucks the whole machine in and destroy uh, the machine. For that reason, uh, we, and that happened, by the way, uh, multiple times. <laughs> we have, in, in, uh, uh, in my hospital, we have a, 
a big poster with all different stretchers, uh, bags uh, with chairs that sucked into the magnet, completely crashed it. So this one, MR safety is one of the major, major issues and priorities. But fortunately here, we actually can detach this table, put it in an outside room, and put a needle inside the lymph nodes. So right now we have a new technique where we can actually inject some ultrasound contrast to confirm what we're in the lymph node. You can see here, this is lymphatic vessels, uh, and we know 100% where they are. And then we started to get uh, uh, these images. So on the left, it's a normal. Uh, Matt, I actually have three normals. <laughs> and we did probably f f in uh, six, seven, 800 around the angiogram, we have three normals. But here's something clearly abnormal, right? This is. This is, you remember, thoracic duct, big uh, and tortuous, but then there's a narrow in here and the lymph going inside the lung parenchyma. This is patient with idiopathic calothorax. So <coughs> over the last uh, um, four or five years, we started to see more, more patients with Gorham, with uh, GLA, KLA. And what we found out that um, the, some of them that have decreased pulmonary function has these two phenomena, interstitial lung disease and chronic pleural effusions that are responsible for the symptoms. And this is an example of interstitial lung disease. It's basically, this is uh, our low, the, the septa between the lobula thickening up. Uh, and, and specifically in, the, uh, in some patients with Gorham disease, uh, GLA, KLA, this is a lymphatic flow that goes into the septa and prevent exchange of the oxygen. The other... Uh, uh, Disease, uh, the, the other condition is uh, uh, pleural fusion. You can see how huge uh, pink pleural fusion compressed lung to almost nothing in, in, in the skin. And you can understand why uh, the pulmonary function as a child is not, not adequate. And uh, uh, Dr. Cameron Trenner here, this is his uh, famous slide that we actually based all our uh, approaches right now, showing that if patients with GLA, KLA, or Gore, uh, uh, Gorman has in lung involvement, their life, life uh, expectancy is significantly shorter. So you can see this is people with no, it's a years to live, and this is the people that don't have lung involvement, and this is the people have lung involvement. So when we started to do, um, and of course we don't do only an angiomatosis patient, we do uh, multiple others, but when we started to do uh, lymphangiogram with the, uh, in, uh, in the patients, the first thing that we discovered is uh, phenomenal, uh, uh, um, the condition what we call pulmonary lymphatic perfusion syndrome. And maybe it's wrong and not precise uh, 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 term, but it's kind of stick at this moment. So the idea here is that all lymph from the lungs normally goes inside the thoracic duct. In patients with this abnormal pulmonary lymphatic perfusion, flow goes inside the lungs. And we found multiple, multiple condition uh, that uh, people present, like a neonatal calatorx, some kids with cardiac disease, heart failure, uh, and so on. So, uh, and this is just a, a, the same uh, schematic representation idea. All this enormous amount of lymph, you remember the first slide is most of the lymph is generated below the diaphragm, 80%, and supposed to carry it into the beautifully into subclavian vein. In this case, it actually go inside the lungs. So uh, we've been fortunate been, been sponsored by LMI and uh, LGA, uh, LGDA and uh, by uh, Pan Orphan uh, Disease uh, Center uh, give us money to conduct the study. Uh, and the goal of this study is try to understand how lymphatic system in kids with, or adults with uh, lymphatic malformation with pulmonary, uh, uh, pulmonary deterioration of pulmonary function look like. And uh, so what our inclusion criteria was pretty much all kids with adults with lymphatic malformation and some evidence of lymphatic involvement, uh, of pulmonary involvement, it was chest x-ray, something or biopsy or MRI. <coughs> so we eventually we screened 26 patients over the last uh, uh, one and a half, two years. Uh, we enrolled 14 patients, uh, split seven, seven girl, uh, girls and boys. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the range was quite significant, so 6 to 63, uh, primarily KLA. Uh, for some reason, Matt Hawkins just said, you, you rarely see that we see primarily KLA uh, patients. So seven of them were KLA, uh, five GLA, and two uh, patients with GSD. Um, 
most of them present it uh, with, of course, we, they have to present with some type of uh, uh, involvement with mediastinal lungs, pleural precardial infusion, interstitial lung disease, um, combination of both uh, fluid, majority of them presented with bone involvement, and seven with, uh, with uh, visceral organ and uh, spleen liver involvement. And that's, for example, uh, uh, how uh, bone involvement look like. This is the, what's colored right now. It's actually what uh, Matt Hawkins showed you, the bo bone involvement, uh, uh, spinal bone involvement, this white signal. Um, the, there's also a patient with mediastinal, primary KLA, exactly the same thing that uh, he showed. This is huge mediastinal masses. Uh, interstitial lung disease, you can see all these lines here. This is actually lymph going inside the lung parenchyma. Um, and we also look at the thoracic duct, and we saw that uh, most of the patient has large in the, uh, tortuous thoracic duct. What does that mean? This is too much flow going through the thoracic duct. Five normal size and a uh, few was absent of thoracic duct because maybe it was uh, already eliminated by the disease. Um, and we found this is abnormal flow, lymphatic flow into lung parenchyma from two sources from the uh, retroperitoneum into mediastinum and then in lungs, from thoracic duct into lung and combination of both. Only in two patients we found that there is no uh, abnormal flow. It's actually flow was opposite, going in the opposite direction. And this is an example. You can see here huge thoracic duct and all this lymph going into the lung. You can understand why this patient has a symptom because this is normal flow going into lung parenchyma. Uh, this is a patient with uh, uh, retroperitoneal. Thoracic duct is actually quite normal, but there's a network of uh, retroperitoneal or behind the abdomen uh, uh, tissue where it make its way into the lung uh, parenchyma. Uh, and this is a combination. You can see, actually, this is thoracic duct. Uh, this is flow of the limb from the thoracic duct, but it's also flow from the retroperitoneal into pleural uh, cavity. Uh, and this is the patient without thoracic duct. It's obviously completely abnormal. But the, uh, and patient actually not that symptomatic, but, but this is completely uh, abnormal lymphangiogram. Uh, and this is normal thoracic duct. And why this patient has normal thoracic duct? Because the lymph in this, it was maybe a bit beyond this discussion, but lymph actually going from the lung into generate enormous amount of from the lungs into the thoracic duct. So uh, we concluded from this study that most of the patients have a, either dilation of the thoracic duct or very, very significant flow in the retroperitoneal lymphatic. So there's potentially uh, some pathophysiological mechanisms that patients with a lymphatic malformation generates too much flow, lymphatic flow. Somehow their vessel is more leakier than in normal patients. The same thing, by the way, we saw so in Noonan patients. By all means, the Noonan patient, down, some Down uh, syndrome kids have this abnormal uh, lymphatic production. Uh, and again, you can see this is another patient. Uh, clinically, he's not symptomatic pulmonary. It's, uh, he just came to us for imaging, but you can see how huge his thoracic duct. But there is no flow from almost uh, enormous amount of flow going inside the lungs. So why some people have this? Why did flow go in the lungs? Because they've been born like that. So uh, we see exactly the same uh, abnormal lymphatic pathways going inside the lung in absolutely healthy patients. They have no symptoms uh, in patients with, with some cardiac patients. So, uh, so why specifically the, 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 the uh, lymphatic malformation uh, kids present because they have this anatomical variant uh, that then, uh, that where the lymphatic vessels go inside the lungs, but also there's increased lymphatic flow. Heart failure is the same. We have a large population of kids with called, condition called plastic bronchitis. We see exactly the same thing that uh, kids with uh, lymphatic malformation has. Why it's important? Because potentially we can correct this lymphatic uh, anatomical variant and improve uh, the patency or improve the uh, uh, survival, uh, decrease the deterioration of lymphatic function and uh, improve survival. So this is, a, again, summary uh, that majority of our patients demonstrated this abnormal pulmonary lymphatic flow, either from thoracic duct 
all from retropeating, retropeating lymphatic ducts, uh, and, uh, and the potentially by closing this lymphatic communication, we can prolong uh, kid survival. And how we do that? How can we close it? We, uh, it was a procedure developed by my, one of my mentors, Dr. Constantin Kopp. He's a father of interventional radiology, a uh, procedure called thoracic duct embolization, where uh, we actually can get inside the thoracic duct and close it. Um, how we do that? Again, we start with lymphangiography to, to roadmap the, the, uh, uh, the condition. Uh, then we see what's called cisterna cali, beginning of a thoracic duct, and then I put small needle into that and put a catheter all the way, uh, wire and catheter in the thoracic duct, and we can uh, see the leakage. So this is an example of what, uh, actually our first case. Uh, we, before, I, we didn't know that it was possible where we came. It was, uh, uh, I'm Israeli also, uh, it's, uh, so I, I went to Israel to help him out, and they said, okay, we have a kid uh, after a lung biopsy, uh, uh, started to leak uh, uh, chyle, and this is child with kaposha form of uh, So when they did an Israel infantry, they clearly saw this abnormal flow going inside the uh, lung parenchyma. And when we put our catheter inside the thoracic duct, we clearly see it goes inside the lung, so we close that. This is how we close it. We put the glue coils and different what's called immunization material that create this blockage of its lymphatic vessels. So, and she improved significantly, but then a uh, few uh, year or two years later, the symptoms kind of start to come back, and we realized uh, during that time that we also need to close this uh, malformation, the retroperitoneal malformation. How we do it? It's much, much more complex. You have to put a needle inside this lymphatic uh, uh, mass and inject glue. It's more complex, more dangerous, less predictable than just close one, one duct, but it does work uh, very, very, very well. And here she is, uh, 2016, by 2018, I have a close follow-up. She's uh, b from being every month in the hospital. She's at home for the last three, four, five years, developing very, very well. She's, of course, on serolums. Uh, this is another example as you saw before. This is a patient with lung symptoms, kaposha form angiomatosis, and this is post-embolization MRI. We completely close this flow, and she's doing much, much, much better. We also started to do lung expansion therapy because the idea is um, these lungs compressed by the fluid, right? And people couldn't breathe. So if we stop the flow and then expand the lungs surgically, in collaboration with surgeon, we can prolong uh, life and improve uh, quality of life with, of the kids. Um, so I strongly feel that all kids uh, with lymphatic malformation have to have this uh, Imaging, not only to see how much lungs are uh, involved, but also to understand better physiology, anatomy, to learn. Uh, also, that may be a good tool, potential tool for uh, surveillance after serolomus or other treatments. Because, in, you know, the serolomus oncological drug, and every onco oncologist will tell you that we, they always have some ways to understand how the cancer responds to the treatment. Right? And we right now, besides symptoms with lymphatic malformation, we don't have that much. So maybe an uh, MR lymphangiogram is one of the ways to see if the uh, lymphatic system is actually responding uh, to serolomus. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for, for your attention.